So I'm driving in my car back to my cabin through the Lamar Valley and Yellowstone National Park under a full moon. As I often do, I pull off and stop and shut off the engine and turn off the lights. The river below me is shrouded with a layer of fog. It's an unbelievable view. It's been another day for me of dealing with park visitors, having them stay away from animals and answering their questions, reminding them that they really need to be safe and keep the animals safe, and explaining to them that the bison are in the mating season, in the full rut. I shut off my engine, I get out, and I stand there. I hear the grunting of a bull bison. Some of you know that sound. I explain to visitors all day that tails up means charge or discharge. A while later, a bit further along, a great gray owl drops off a snow stake as I'm driving back toward my cabin. And it glides across the road through the beam of my headlights. It's the size of a stump. I've seen and I've learned so much during my time in Yellowstone, stuff that I never thought I'd see. Every day, I'm transferring what I've learned to people who have never been in this place before, or seen a coyote, or an elk, or a moose. This spring, I saw an old grizzly bear that we call Scarface walk right through a group of startled visitors on his way to get food. I see dozens of bears every season, grizzlies and black bears, probably more than any other ranger in Yellowstone. I see weather that most people never get to see, triple rainbows, sudden hailstorms, blue skies, 365 degree views. I see waterfalls that take my breath away. I work outdoors in the midst of one of the largest intact ecosystems on Earth. I've been mentored by countless wildlife guides, biologists, and experts, and by knowledgeable regulars that I've come to meet along the roadsides, many of whom have become lifelong friends. I often see wolves, and I hear them howling in this incredible place, and I watch and learn from their very complex social behavior. Oh, 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 oh. It's amazing. In 2004, I retired from WGBH, Boston's public broadcasting station. I worked there during the big growth years. I was a lucky guy. Julia Child, Alistair Cook, Nova, Masterpiece Theater, this old house. You know the lineup. I started in production, and then I became their main mendicant, their fundraiser. And I raised millions of dollars with my staff from corporations, from individuals, and from foundations. It was a wonderful run. And my career there during those early days spanned over 40 years. I had three wonderful children. I was active in my community, as many of you are here. And I served on boards, and I did the whole nine yards. And then, like some of you here, and many of you who will have this happen in the future, I arrived at that gold watch moment. Suddenly, in what seemed like a fraction of a second, I was no longer Mr. WGBH. Public broadcasting and NPR became something that I watched and that I listened to, not the place where I went to work. And at age 65, I was suddenly a pip, a previously important person. <laughs> so what was I to do? I sought the counsel of friends, and one of them said, take everything that you've done before in your life and put it in the rearview mirror. Put it where you can see it, the good, the hurdles, the whole nine yards. But look out the front windshield. That conversation was the key to my own shift, my metamorphosis. 
I now realize that I was sitting on the edge of an enormous new opportunity to shift into new work, a time to try new things that really mattered to me and that touched my heart, things that I had dreamt about as a kid. You know, in that moment, you suddenly lose your former identity, and that very often defined who you were. You're no longer the senior partner, the head of surgery, the, you know, the chief, the superintendent, that guy from public broadcasting, whatever it is. So gold watch in hand, you wonder what to do next. Few people know how, how hard you worked. And they don't even notice that you're gone, it turns out. But like millions of other boomers who are now perched on that same edge, it's also a moment of enormous possibility for lots of us. It's a time to look out the front windshield and to harness your passions. Maybe you were an engineer who saw the waters into which your colleagues dumped their sewage catch fire. So, after you left that work, you moved to the mountains and you took on a new task, which was writing a column, a no-nonsense conservation column in the newspaper and you told it like it was, Bert Rains. Or maybe after a long time making fishing gear and climbing equipment and rescue stuff, you took up welding and you began crafting large, beautiful sculptures that harnessed your muse and that also found their place in the front places of museums and corporations and businesses all across the country. I came to the West uh, to find the place that had inspired me earlier on, to find balance, to figure out what I wanted to do next. And one day, I walked into the Yellowstone Park Foundation in Bozeman, Montana. It's now called Yellowstone Forever. How do you people raise the private money that you do to help Yellowstone Park, I asked the receptionist. I think I may have thought in some distant way that maybe I could be of some help to them because I cared so much about conservation. She introduced me to Michael Carey, who was then the president of the foundation. Michael told me about raising money for a new visitor center and some of the other projects that he was uh, working on at that time. He casually mentioned that they were also funding two small summer internships, working in Lamar Valley, get this, as wolf ambassadors with the help of the Student Conservation Association, the park, and some generous donors. Now, I was a little old to be a student applicant, but it turns out that I was a student and therefore qualified. <laughs> wow, I thought, I've got to get one of those uh, internships. And so I applied, and so I did. And each day before dawn, I got up and I went out into Lamar Valley, as you know, one of the most beautiful and wild places on Earth. I sat at the feet of the top biologists, the outdoor guides, others. I met the rangers, one by one, people who in many cases were half or less of my age. They accepted me, and one day, the district ranger took me into her office and said, you should become a ranger. And so I applied, and I got the job, and I've proudly worn the famous flat hat and the badge and all the stuff. Uh, for 14 seasons now. My work is with the protection division. I work more animal jams than any other ranger. <laughs> That's the place, as most of you know, where bears or other critters and people come together. Now, it's easy to make fun of that, but that's the seam, that's the place where the wild and the human landscape come together. And so we try to keep the critters and the people safe. It's a very important place. And so what I did is I threw myself into that task with the same enthusiasm that I used to go on the air at WGBH and say, call that number, make your pledge, and do all that stuff. <laughs> I also work as an EMT, and that's serious stuff. It's about 100 miles to the nearest hospital in many places that we are in Yellowstone. So I see a lot, and it's not all cheerful. And I do whatever I can 
in that work and in every other way to assist the visitors and the other rangers as best I can. In addition, um, in my dotage, I am naturally now a steward of the wild, a host in America's first national park. It's an amazing opportunity, and I feel very fortunate. I'm doing it partly with the voice of Marty Murie, the grandmother of conservation. I went to see her when she was in her final days. And I sat with her and held her hand, and she held mine. And I said, what can I do? And she said, save the wild. So each day, I do my best to try to elevate the experience of every visitor that I come in contact with. I fail every day, but I try. I try to also, uh, when I do that, realize that what I'm doing is elevating my own experience and that of my family and everybody I love uh, because every day is an adventure for me. So to be frank about it, I'm also not a bad investment for the park because my pay as a GS5 general ranger is frankly pretty low. I rent my own cabin just outside the park in the northeast entrance up in Little Silvergate, population seven. <laughs> I have contact with between 25 and 50,000 visitors every year, rough count. And I also have a lot of hustle and I care a lot. So I think to be frank about it and not egocentric, I'm not a bad deal for the park either. So let's go back to that gold watch moment for just a minute. Mark Friedman of Encore.org says it's an incredible new opportunity to unleash your passions. Now some of you are not anywhere near that point, but I assure you, you will be there. So think about it. Mark reminds us that years ago, we would have retired at that moment. We would have gone to the porch. We would have watched the sun setting. And maybe we would have written our memoirs. Retirement was a, a creature of the Industrial Revolution, a way to sit back and rest from your toil in the factory or the railroad or wherever you worked and wait for God to snatch you away. But now, most of us are healthy. And when we get that gold watch, we want to do something else. We want to give back. And we want to stay and be active. So sitting on the porch for us isn't a good option. We're smart, we're experienced, and some of us have saved up a tiny bit of money. And we're an enormous force in the country and in the world for positive change. Some of this group may prefer to travel, or others want, may want to be president of their homeowners association, or play canast at the senior center, and that's fine. But I'm talking about those people who really want to get going, and there are a lot of them. I say that a better idea is to find new work at that point, when you reach it. To never use the word retired, to lean forward, to open a new chapter, to shift into new gear, to begin something entirely new that you've never thought about doing, maybe, unless you were young. And when you were young, you probably had some good ideas, and I bet you have them now. So I say go for it. Think what could happen to our world if a large proportion of all the people who are hitting that gold watch moment would do just that. Think what could happen if the big agencies, like the National Park Service, or the government, or the schools, or businesses, all across the country, actively recruited from this enormous pool of new affordable talent and solicited the best of these older people and put them to work in brand new ways. These experienced, talented geezers, and I'm one of them, <laughs> could be additive to what they already do, not just as volunteers, and a lot of agencies have good volunteer programs, but in addition to that, be paid people to do important work, seasonal, part-time, or other. Think what could happen, too, if the internet was harnessed to match such people with new work and encourage them to do this. And what if geezer chat rooms were opened up in new ways that give people, eh? 
better ways to compare notes and help them decide what they can do and how to do it. Although they may have to have their children help them actually do that. <laughs> so I'm standing here as just one living example that such a plan can really work. I'm here to testify firsthand that retirement is an outmoded concept. I'm here to encourage you, when you hit that point, to embrace it, to refuse to retire, to never use that word. Instead, to jump in and to find new work, to turn the page, to knock on doors if they're not open, and to take the risk, to become a senior ranger, to wear a new sort of a hat to help show the companies and the agencies and the organizations that this enormous, enormous, talented, and eager group of new, older workers like yourself is ready to go to work now and at a fair price. To help them set up new mechanisms to recruit such people and welcome them and place them in new good work. And to know that this moment of metamorphosis and of change and of starting over from the bottom may become one of the best things that you and that the agencies and organizations that hire you ever do. It may become your great awakening and maybe theirs. So, put what you did in the rearview mirror. Look out that front windshield and go for it. And thank you. <laughs>